All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's EL webinar. Um, the topic for this evening is a very challenging one, and uh, we'll be talking about endometriosis cyst. Um, and our speaker tonight, Adrian Crestani, uh, is having this, uh, this challenge to <clears throat> talk about the uh, optimal technique. Um, and his focus is going to be on the laparoscopic ethanol sclerotherapy. Um, tonight's moderator is going to be EL's president, uh, Dr. Harald Krentel. Um, before starting, we'd like to thank our uh, sponsor for EL's webinars, Gideon Richter, and for that, uh, allow me to play a short. Okay. So for tonight's EL webinar, the moderator is going to be Dr. Harold Kendall. He is the head of the OBGYN department in Bethesda Hospital in Duisburg and uh, the president of the European Endometriosis League. And without any further ado, I'm going to hand this over to him to present our tonight's speaker. Yeah, thank you, dear Alin. Uh, good evening to everybody. and. Um especially to Dr. Adrian Cristani from Paris. Um, we are very happy that you accepted our invitation for tonight. Um, Dr. Cristani is uh, part of the team in Hospital Tenon in uh, Sorbonne, Paris, and he specialized in uh, uh, gynecological surgery and minimally invasive surgery, especially in endometriosis and gynecological cancer. And uh, he did a fellowship with uh, Professor Roman in Bordeaux, and um, he focused, I think, also during that fellowship on the technique of laparoscopic sclerotherapy and the treatment of ovarian endometriosis. And uh, he recently uh, published uh, two very uh, nice papers on that topic, one in uh, JMIC and uh, another manuscript was published in fertility sterility very recently too so <clears throat> he's very up to date to this uh, modern approach and um, the discussion on how to treat ovarian endometriosis i think is ongoing it's a long long lasting discussion it's very controversial there are a lot of questions questions for surgeons questions for specialists in reproduction and the, the question is, what would be the ideal approach to treat ovarian endometriomas? De does it depend on size, on age, on deep infiltrating endometriosis, or which are the factors? And the question is, what is the role in the future for sclerotherapy? And uh, I think tonight, in the next um, 55 minutes, we will be able to give some answers. And of course, as always, we invite you to ask your question. Thank you very much um, for being with us tonight. Um, and we are very happy to listen to your presentation. Thank you very much, Harald and Eileen, for this introduction. I'm so honored to be here tonight. As I was telling you before, it's very special for me to be on the other part of the screen because I'm an avid watcher, a viewer of these uh, webinars. Uh, I will share my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Perfect. Thank you very much. So it's not, we, as you said, we're going to talk about laparoscopic ethanol sclerotherapy in the ovarian endometriosis. We're going to talk about different alternatives. Uh, and uh, so first I would like, oh, I cannot. Oh, yeah. So I'd like to start by saying that I have no competing interest in this field. 
Uh, this is the outline of my presentation tonight. First, I would like to do a short introduction and talk about four facts that uh, we all should know when we treat uh, endometriomas. Uh, the second, uh, second point would be an um, introduction about all the different weapons that you will have uh, in the operating room when you will have to treat an endometrioma. Then, as the topic is uh, this topic tonight, we will talk about uh, laparoscopic sclerotherapy, the technique, the results of our study. And I would like to say that uh, these results, uh, I just did the, the, the numbers uh, for this presentation tonight and the actualization of the data, uh, the one year data that we published. Um, so it could be new data. Uh, and then we'll talk about the limits and maybe the future. And then we'll do a short conclusion. So I would like to. Oh, I would like to. I heard some noise. I think is everything good. Um, I would like to sh talk about four facts that we all should know uh, if when we manage endometrioma. The first and the most evident one is that endometriomas are very frequent. Uh, when you manage patients with endometriosis, it is something that you see every day. Uh, and it's uh, very interesting to see that uh, to date we didn't have any uh, the perfect treatment for endometrioma. And this is the research. This is very interesting. Uh, the prevalence in the literature is between 20 to 50 percent. So very common uh, endometrioma form. Uh, the second thing is that it is very easy to recognize on the imaging. Uh, you will have no surprise when you go to the operating room. And the other important thing is that when you show these, these, these uh, to my uh, residents, they will all say they are in the bedroom without any doubt. So no surprise when you go to the operator and not like when you treat a bowel endometriosis and you will have the surprise of a nodule that you would not expect and will change your way of treating. You can prepare your patient to the treatment you will do in the, in the uh, OR. The third point is that endometriomas are associated to the most severe form of endometriosis. This means that when you go for surgery and a very hard surgery with vaginal uh, bowel or uterine uh, endometriosis, as sh showed this paper of the French team of uh, Charles Chaperon, um, you will have to manage to endometrioma. But this is a question that you will ask yourself repeatedly uh, in the operating room. And the fourth thing, which is to me the most interesting, uh, is the content of this system. So obviously, uh, it's not chocolate. Uh, it's brown because the most uh, common element in this milieu is iron uh, because of the chronic hemorrhagic cycles uh, inside the, the, the system. These irons are responsible for the Fenton reaction. The Fenton reaction creates reactive oxygen species that you can see uh, here. Those reactive oxygen species are strong inducers of uh, uh, reactive uh, of uh, of oxidative stress in viable cells. They are regulating the gene expression, the protein activity of pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, uh, adhesion molecules, growth, and angiogenic factors. These inducers, as we can easily understand, uh, and they permeate through the cyst wall uh, and the surrounding tissue, the ovary or the uterus, uh, will suffer from uh, reduced oxygenation, uh, fibrosis, and you will have the neovascularization that we all see uh, surrounding the, the cyst. In the, the, the ovary, in the normal ovary that surrounds the, the cyst, it will reduce the follicular matur maturation and the, the follicular density. So when you treat a woman with a non metrioma, your target uh, will be this thin layer of endometrial like tissue that surrounds the cyst. Uh, with low uh, or no collateral damage to the fibrous layer that surrounds it in order to preserve uh, the, the ovarian tissue. For these, you will have many weapons. Um, I will do a, sh a sh talk about uh, all of them, but um, I would like tonight to present you the, the laparoscopic sclerotherapy as a new reliable one uh, in specific indication. 
So cystectomy, um, many data now have proven that the, the, the surgical illusion of, uh, uh, of a surgical plane is an histological illusion. Uh, when you look at the cyst that you took off in the laboratory, uh, as many other papers, but this one is very interesting, many other papers have proven that uh, you will have follicles in the laboratory with your cyst. So this is, uh, there is a proportional concurrence of ovarian resection in the cystectomy. And th this resection uh, can be measured, one of the ways to measure it, uh, is the fall in antimalarian hormone uh, a few months after uh, the, the surgical treatment. And this, this, this is, it is around 2.1 nanogram per milliliter after nine months. The recurrence rate of this technique is between nine to 26%, depending on the studies. And we'll uh, compare these numbers to the other techniques after. So now you have uh, ablative techniques. These ablative techniques are uh, number two, uh, CO2 laser and the argon plasma. I will talk about the other one after. The CO2 laser, uh, most of the publication was made, uh, were made by uh, the team of Massimo Candiani in, in Milano. Uh, they uh, are excellent studies. Uh, they prove that uh, the CO2 laser uh, postoperative uh, pregnancy rates are excellent. 70%, uh, the, the fall in IMH is quite low, around one nanogram per milliliter. The recurrence rate is uh, excellent too. But one element is very interesting, and when you have practiced uh, the CO2 laser or the argon uh, plasma, uh, you will understand quickly the size matters, the size of the cyst matters. Uh, why? Because when you have when you do the treatment, the surgical treatment with the laser or the plasma, uh, you will have to reserve to, to reverse, sorry, the cyst. And it will be very hard to perfectly put the energy on the cyst wood. And this was proved statistically in, in the study. Uh, when the endometrial amide is above uh, five centimeters, you will have a double risk of recurrence of the endometrium. So let's talk about argon plasma. Most of the literature in this way were, were made by uh, Horace Roman. Pregnancy rates are comparable to, uh, to the CO2 laser with a 70% rate of uh, uh, um, a pregnancy rate, sorry. We don't have any uh, information about the fall of antimalarian hormonal uh, and the recurrence rates, uh, it uh, is around 10%. So this is what happened when you, this is the perfect patient for this ablative technique. You have a, an endometrium on the, on the left ovary, you reverse the cyst, the reversion is perfect. You just have to spray the energy. It's quite small, so it's going to be done in a, a few minutes and uh, you will be very pleased of yourself. But what happens, uh, for example, for this patient? This is uh, a young woman. She has a very big rectal nodule, uh, sigmoid nodule of uh, or, or almost uh, six centimeters, and she has a huge uh, uh, endometrium of uh, around uh, 10 centimeters. You can imagine this pelvis, in this pelvis, everything is going to be frozen. It's going to be very hard to reverse the cyst uh, and, and to, uh, to do the antigelysis to have these perfect images as we saw before of the, the ovary uh, completely reversed. So when you think about how best treatment would be, it needs to cover perfectly the, under, the, the cyst wall. And in this manner, a liquid would be perfect. So this is where it's a very intelligent way of treating, uh, and, and I can say, uh, and this is the first publication about uh, this technique is uh, from the team of the Chico Nardone um, of the Jamili Hospital. They published the first study in JMIG of 53 patients, big cyst, four to, to 10 centimeters, and they treated with uh, all around almost the same volume of the, 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 the cyst itself, most of the patients uh, were treated uh, uh, that were treated that had associated deep endometriosis. Almost 25% uh, of them were treated only for the sclerotherapy. They had the next and follow-up of 
41 months, low recurrence rate compared to the two other techniques that we saw before. And the pregnancies uh, were excellent in 24 months. So when I arrived uh, in, uh, in, in Bordeaux, one of the first surgery I saw was Horace Roman or, or Benjamin Merlo, I don't remember, doing the sclerotherapy. And I, I, I was very shocked because I didn't know this technique, I can, I can say. It was, I saw the publication of the French team doing vaginal uh, sclerotherapy and I knew it was a, a known technique, the transvaginal sclerotherapy, but the laparoscopic sclerotherapy for me was so interesting. So the first thing I did uh, was uh, a tutorial that was published in Fertile and Sterility. And um, I would quick, uh, it, small images are better than a lot of words. So this is like how you can you can do, and it's quite easy to uh, do a laparoscopic sclerotherapy for. First, you will have to do a puncture of the cyst, either directly with your talker. When the cyst is huge, 12, 15 centimeters, you will have to go directly with the choker. You, you have to uh, use your suction to uh, take off. You see all these uh, uh, neovascularization, adhesions. Uh, you take off the, the cyst content. And you don't have to touch anything to the surrounding disease. And it's easier if you don't touch to anything. And then you flush the inside of the, the cyst. And then you will introduce um, the, the Foley catheter directly into the hole that you just made, either with the trocar or uh, anything. You, you inflate the balloon of the Foley catheter. And then you can put the ethanol. And then you have 10 to 15 minutes. We'll talk about that later. Uh, we will have 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, to do whatever you like. Um, and in this case, uh, we were doing an appendectomy, which took uh, nine minutes maybe. So this is what you need for laparoscopic sclerotherapy. You don't need a special generator of special, very expensive thing. It's ethanol, a 60 milliliter syringe, and a folic catheter. So uh, Horace Roman, asked me to uh, do this review of the data of the, the, the sclerotherapy that they, they did uh, during the period of uh, July uh, 2019 to March 2021. That was the first analysis that we published. And I will present you uh, data of uh, March 2022 that I just made last week. Uh, so it was all the patients with one or more endometriomas above four centimeters that were planned for endometriosis surgery. So none of the patients were planned just for the sclerotherapy. This is very important to, to understand. We asked the patient uh, to do an anti-malaria normona and or, uh, an ultrasound at least six months after the surgery. And we looked for recurrence uh, and trial count if they wanted a pregnancy uh, or they accepted to do the, the, the anti follicle count, pregnancies and symptoms. So the first result, and to me, it's very important to, to understand this, is the population of uh, this study. I will put some very precocious uh, brackets. Uh, they are quite old for, for a patient. They are 33 years old. So when you um, look in the literature about the techniques uh, in, uh, in the surgical techniques in endometriomas, the population is a little bit younger, we like to say 29 to, to 31 years old, so quite an uh, old patient, um, old. Uh, they are, most of them, 80% of them are milliparous, infertile, um, um, and they have big cyst. Here you can see uh, the, the maximum size was uh, 17 centi uh, 16 centimeters, and the, the lowest were four, four, four centimeters. Uh, but the mean size is seven centimeters. So the next uh, fourth point is that most of these women have severe endometriosis. And here you see that uh, uh, for 47% of them, almost 50%, we did bowel surgery. So this is the worst case when you have to manage endometrioma. 33 years old, 
infantile or nulliparous huge cyst and a, a severe form of endometriosis. First uh, uh, result of, uh, of the study, and it's comparable to the, the results we published. Uh, we published the results of uh, mean difference between the preoperative and postoperative very much of 1.3 nanogram per milliliter. The, uh, the actualized data uh, is 1.19 nanogram per milliliter with the preoperative mean of 3.18 and a postoperative mean of uh, 2 uh, nanogram per milliliter. So there is a difference. Now we can we can say how much is it? We can put a, a number. Uh, there is an impact of the technique on the on the ovarian reserve. We don't know, but on the antimony and hormona. Yes, there is a number. The, the second interesting result uh, is the, the univariable and multivariable. Uh, uh, analysis and it showed that the only variable that was associated with a higher fall, uh, uh, higher delta of antimalaria hormona is the preoperative antimalaria hormona. And this is very important and, and, and interesting for the patient because when you see a, a patient with a huge endometrioma that and you have this number of, I don't know, maybe five or six of antimalarian hormona in nanogram per millimeter. It may not be represent, it may not represent the actual reserve. And this was proved by other studies before. A higher, a bigger cyst, bigger endometriomas have higher preoperative antimalarian hormona. Uh, second result, an interesting one, is the pregnancies. So we had only 50, we had only, we had 55 women that wishing to conceive after the surgery. 25 of them uh, had uh, pregnancies. Um, and the, the ratio of uh, assisted reproductive technology was inverted 61% oh, yeah. with RRT and 40% uh, 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 was uh, spontaneous. Um, uh, the recurrence is uh, seven out of uh, 64 women that actually did uh, the ultrasound after the surgery. So that is 11%. Uh, five of them had a normal treatment. This is quite interesting. Uh, three of them were under a stroprogestative pill, rightly taken every day. And the same two of them uh, were dianagists. The follow-up, I don't have the number of the follow-up because I need to call some more of these uh, women, but the follow-up actually is uh, uh, around 20 months. So we're waiting for uh, some more data. Uh, some other interesting results that I would like to present uh, tonight uh, is, the first one is that I we can confirm in this study that the preoperative hormona is proportional to the size uh, of the endometrioma, first important result, and was proven before I was telling you. The second thing, and everything, every time I do this presentation, I have this question, very interesting question of people that actually do the sclerotherapy and they, they don't know how much time they have to wait. Um, I can't give you a, an answer right now, but I can say that for the 20, almost 20 women out of uh, more than 100, women that underwent laparoscopic sclerotherapy. therapy. Um, we, we did for 20 of them more than 10 minutes. And it was not associated with less recurrence. It was not associated with less pregnancies. It was not associated with a higher uh, decrease uh, in intermediate anomaly. So we cannot say exactly how much, but if it's a little bit more than 10 minutes, it's not bad. So, in, very important thing is the adverse events. We did not have a, uh, any adverse events specifically related to the ethanol, as it has been uh, uh, published for uh, transvaginal scale therapy. Um, we didn't have any problem uh, with that. Long talk but a very uh, quick image to see the results. This is the patient, one of the, the images that I showed you before. This patient had two endometrioma, one was 71 millimeter, the other one was five centimeters. And this is an MRI, it was 
this was made in uh, Bordeaux. Uh, this MRI three months after you would have uh, these uh, two scars uh, of uh, the endometriomas here and here. And you see actually that there are uh, many follicles on these others. So let's talk about the limits. Um, first, we have technical limits. Uh, it's uh, quite easy to understand. When you have a multilocular cyst, it's impossible to do uh, the, the, the technique. Uh, easy to understand. And the second interesting thing is the ethanol availability. Uh, I was talking with uh, Vivek and Sandesh Kadal in, in India, uh, with this excellent um, Congress about endometriosis in India. And they told me that they wanted to do uh, laparoscopic sclerotherapy, but they didn't, did not have ethanol. And sometimes it can be one of the limits. Our study limit, so we can talk about uh, the follow-up. Uh, in a few weeks, I have the, the latest data of the follow-up. Maybe this number will change a little bit, but uh, this would be uh, one of the limits. The volume of ethanol, we don't have any data because um, the technique itself is not exactly like uh, the Italian team. Uh, we don't believe that 100% uh, of the cyst can be uh, in, in ethanol uh, can be put inside the cyst because you will have the, the volume of the balloon of the catheter, and you don't need to put 100% of the volume of the cyst because you, uh, you will have the risk of spillage. But just with capillarity, when you take a deflated balloon and you put uh, water in it, you will see that the water uh, touches all the walls of the, the, of the cyst. Uh, so we don't have this data. Um, another very important point is it's quite a, more about a social uh, point is only 59 patients uh, had pre, pre and postoperative antimalarial anomalies. This is one of the limits of a social uh, uh, security uh, thing is that uh, antimalarial anomaly was not reimbursed uh, two years ago. So um, most of the, the, the women did not want to do this, uh, this test because they had to pay for it, same as the, the ultrasound, um, and they did not understand exactly why, they, even if we talked to them. Now it's reimbursed, but uh, you need to be very specific and say it's because of endometriosis, and most of the laboratory don't make the procedure to reimburse. So this is one of the limits. Most of the women that did not do it was because the social security did not reimburse. Or they thought they would not be reimbursed. Uh, we have some pending questions, and I'm sure that uh, somebody will uh, ask them. And uh, the first one is, is cystectomy uh, feasible after an ethanol sclerotherapy? Uh, I do not have this experience. I'm sorry, but uh, I, I don't know actually. And maybe someone in the assembly did did some. Uh, and is it feasible to do to repeat uh, ethanol sclerotherapy after uh, an ethanol sclerotherapy? There is no proof. There is no way uh, that anyone can say uh, he actually knows about that. But. Uh, as we were using uh, transvaginal sclerotherapy for uh, uh, recurrence cyst, maybe uh, we can see, think that if you go for big surgery, I don't know, five years after your first one and you have a recurrence of endometriosis, bowel endometriosis and an endometrium, maybe it is feasible uh, to, uh, to, uh, to use this technique if you have a very big cyst. Uh, that's that's a pending question. The the answers of all of the questions are uh, in the, the randomized uh, control trials, and there are two very interesting randomized control trials that are uh, actually recruiting. The first one is uh, the Gemini Hospital, and it's the comparison of uh, the paroscopic uh, stripping versus therapy. and the second one is a Korean one. Same ID. Uh, uh, it's uh, it, it will talk about ovarian function and therapeutic efficacy after sclerotherapy or uh, um, uh, stripping. Uh, in short conclusion, I would like to propose a tailor-made care for endometrium. Uh, as uh, Arl was uh, saying, there is uh, not only one treatment for one. Uh, patient for, for all the patients. It's 
we need to do a tailor-made. We need to adapt our techniques to the patient and to the disease that is inside the pelvis. Uh, so this is a proposition. Uh, the cystectomy, now we have more data that say that it should be avoided, um, except if you have any idea of uh, suspicion, then you will have to do a cystectomy or you have no, absolutely no desire for pregnancy uh, and or the age is above uh, 40 years old, as I was watching the webinar of uh, Professor Vecellini about the tra tra transformation of some and, and the association with cancer. You, you, you can do a cystectomy if uh, you're uh, older, the patient is older. The second way of treating an endometrioma would be the drainage. We didn't talk about this technique before, but when you do a drainage, you have 100%, and this is proved, there is no discussion about that, you have 100% recurrence rate. Um, this means that you will have to do like one month after the, the IVF. Uh, or if you don't want to do the IVF after, you will need to use uh, uh, normal to, 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 to prevent the recurrence. And the only hormone that have proven this is a uh, dianagest. And to, it, at the beginning of the month of March in France, it will, uh, it is now very hard to uh, prescribe dianagest because of the risk of uh, brain tumors. And it will change uh, our way of thinking about uh, this ovarian treatment. Now, let's talk about the ablative technique. Uh, we talked about the laser and plasma. It is uh, such a good technique, excellent result, result if you have a, not small, but if you have a, a medium size endometrioma, or it is multilocular, and, but easy <laughs> to, uh, uh, to reverse, or if there are more than two cysts, because we don't have any data about uh, multiple sclerotherapy. If you have, it's better if it's unilocular because it will be easier, but if you have big cysts above six centimeters, you can propose uh, to your patient uh, uh, laparoscopic, sclerother laparoscopic sclerotherapy. Quick word about transvaginal sclerotherapy. You saw that I didn't talk at, uh, about transvaginal sclerotherapy because to me, there's no comparison about transvaginal sclerotherapy or laparoscopic. And, uh, sclerotherapy, when you do laparoscopic sclerotherapy, you treat all the deep endo that is associated with it, because in this study, we didn't go only for laparoscopic sclerotherapy. It was always ovarian treatment and deep endo treatment. So there is no comparison. Thank you very much for uh, watching this topic tonight. And I am uh, avidly uh, waiting for your questions. <clears throat> yeah, dear Adrian, thank you so much for your kind, very nice presentation. Um, I, I think there will be some questions because um, you, you showed us a new technique and at the end you, you showed us um, your idea of how we should treat uh, ovarian endometriomas and the cystectomy in uh, your slide uh, was a technique which was just... Um, proposed for patients which are not seeking um, pregnancy in the future. So this is interesting because uh, I think, I don't know exactly, but I, I would um, think that most of the people do cystectomy and they still do cystectomy. And even many people might do that in uh, recurrent ovarian endometriomas. Yeah? But let's talk just about the the initial endometrioma and um is that right so so you would say mm, there's no place for a cystectomy in patients who want to become pregnant in the future and then the choice has to be made between uh, sclerotherapy or um, um ablative techniques with laser is that right Yes, that's why with the data that we have now, I, we can say that, but it's the data are very low. It's the retrospective studies. So the two arguments for this. The first one is that when you rip off the, the, the cyst from the ovary, uh, you will have a higher fall in antimineral hormone. The, the answer will simply be yes, but antimineral hormone is not pregnancy rate and studies, meta-analysis have proven that 
the pregnancy rates after cystectomy are comparable to uh, to other treatments. So this is a true argument. We have not proven the superiority in uh, pregnancies of one of the uh, the techniques of uh, uh, cystectomy versus the others. So this is uh, a good uh, good point. But doing a cystectomy, when you know that it will be, have a bigger impact on the ovary, you will have a, a risk of a bleeding. And there is another technique that is quicker, uh, easier, uh, and, and has a lower impact on the ovary with good uh, uh, performance on pregnancy. I think uh, scientifically, uh, it's harder for me to, to understand. But um, since we do not have to date a randomized control trial, I cannot exclude completely cystectomy. Yes, but it's anyway, it's evident that we have to take care uh, of the AMH levels and the results in that. Uh, yeah. Point, yeah. Because this is something new too for, for many uh, people. And, and I think now there's no doubt about it. Um, just to ask a quick question to make it clear, um, you showed the post-operative AMH level. At what time uh, did you measure that level after surgery? So the, it was at least six months after the surgery, uh, and the, the mean uh, time is around 10 months after. And that is according to the literature in, in other studies? Sorry? Uh, th this is the same time that most of the authors use in their publications. Uh, the, 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 in the literature, there's no, um, uh, it's not always at the same time. Some of them do it at three months, some of them at six and nine and 12. So we just ask the patient to uh, do at least six months after, but you know, it's, it's not, they do not uh, to take the appointment at a special specific date um, but uh, we want it to be further than the, the, the this period of three to six months when you have like a, a small a small increase and then the decrease so yeah we, we want it to be more than six to nine months <clears throat> yeah thank you so I, I would like to go through the the questions of the audience and there's one question and uh it's um, a question by your Kekstein, and um, you, you stopped the video, you remember, and then you said you have to wait for 10 to 15 minutes. So I, I was wondering if the video is going to go on. <laughs> is, um, because, because the question is, um, after 10 to 15 minutes, then you take out the alternol, and then the surgery continues. And what do you yeah. do with the cyst? Because it's still big. Do you do um, over your... No, no, no. You aspirate. you aspirate the content of the cyst. Yes, but still yeah. it's big. So it's still a big cyst. And what, what do you do then? Oh, it depends. Either you use um, some, um, some knots to expose uh, the ovary, but we keep it like this. I don't... We do. We just do. The next step is a small biopsy of the the the, the hole in in the ovary, and and then we continue with the surgery. Can you receive me? And uh, yes. And do you do usually uh, an ovaropexy in in that surgery? Yeah. Depending on the surgery that we have to do, but if you have a big cyst, yeah, you need to do an ovaropexy with the T lift or. Uh, or anything that you have, yeah. Yeah, and, and at the end of your surgery, do you see that the size of the cyst uh, is smaller? No, no, or the, the, the sclerosis, ovary? the fibrosis is not. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's deflated, so yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. smaller. But um, the, after you can, after you do, after the, the treatment, the orient treatment, you do the adhesiolysis, you do the resection of uh, the, the, the endometriosis, so yeah, it mm -hmm. looks deflated. Um, then there's another question about the pregnancy rates after that kind of treatment, because uh, there, there is a bias concerning these rates when you do combined surgery. Sorry, sorry. Is my connection that bad? 
No, 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 it's me. It's me. It's my... Sorry. Okay. Yeah, be good. No, when you combine surgery, so you do deep endo surgery and you do laparoscopic sclerotherapy, and then you measure pregnancy yeah. rates. So there are a lot of confounders. Yeah. 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 That's true. That's true. Uh, we would need to, uh, to separate groups of uh, patients with uh, uh, deep endo, depending on the, the uh, RSR, ISRM or. Uh, but uh, we did not, in the analysis, uh, in the materialized analysis, we didn't find any uh, difference between the groups of uh, women treated with the bowel endometriosis or without bowel endometriosis. Um, there's is another the only... question by uh, Bensi Said Lamia, and the question is if you close the puncture side or do you no. just let it open? No, we aspirate the ethanol. Um, do a biopsy of uh, the, the walls, the hole, and then we let it uh, like this. Yes. Um, and uh, Mohamed Ibrahim is asking, um, after how many months did patients go for assisted reproductive techniques? After how many months? Uh, in France, after 30 years old, uh, it's uh, six months. Uh, but I don't have actually the data of the mean uh, time. Uh, but uh, since you understand that uh, they had, they have, uh, they are quite old with big cysts and very extensive endometriosis, uh, we can easily understand that maybe they were um, brought to the uh, assisted reproductive technology quicker uh, compared to a patient uh, with low low severity. And um, then there's another question from Elvin Piriev uh, about um, possible complications of that technique. What would you think are complications that you can encounter during that surgery? Um, during this, for the specific technique of ethanol sclerotherapy, as I showed, as I told you, as I showed in the in the depot, we didn't have did not encounter any specific uh, complication. But uh, it, it, there are published data uh, about uh, the complication of the technique, vaginal specifically, and it would be, we can easily imagine, if you have a very big cyst and you put uh, for a long time the ethanol, uh, you can have uh, ethanol uh, uh, intoxication. And there are uh, data about uh, uh, ethanol uh, measuring uh, blood samples, uh, and it shows that there is ethanol in the blood of the woman. But uh, it is uh, we did not experience any problem with that in our experience. In in our experience, but we did not. Now we'd like to be clear with that we did not measure. We did not. We did not have, have blood samples of uh, the ethanol measurement of our patient after. But they did not. Any, they did not have any symptoms. Thank you. Um, there is another question from uh, Professor Tana Usta, and he's asking about the uh, terminology of recurrence rate. So, do you talk about symptom recurrence or lesion recurrence? That's a very interesting question. Thank you very much. So, we wanted to be quite hard um, with us, and the definition of recurrence is. You do an ultrasound and there is a cyst on the same ovary above 20 millimeters. It can be a scar, I don't know. It can be, uh, uh, it's an, an, a cyst that looks like an endometrioma on the same ovary above 20 millimeters. So maybe we measure something that are not recurrences. Uh, the mean size of the recurrences uh, were, uh, I think, 36 millimeter or 40, uh, but it's lower than, uh, than like, yeah, three to four centimeters. So maybe we measure something that is not uh, an actual recurrence. So we wanted to be clear with that. And uh, the, the, the symptoms of the specific symptom for animation were not, uh, the patient did not have any symptoms. Okay, thank you. And um, Professor Engin Oral, um, also from Istanbul, is asking uh, about the AMH decrease because it was more significant than what we expected. What is your comment on that? It is more um, more significant. Uh, uh, 
it, the, the number has, is higher? This is the question or it is very no, it, significant? It, it, if you compare it to, to the drop of AMH in, after surgery, the, the, uh, the, the decrease of AMH is still quite significant. So the question is why? Why is it so significant? The, if, if we don't touch actually the ovary, it, it could be a less decrease. So that's the, that's the question, I think. Yeah, that's, there, is, there is an impact and there is an impact on the, of the technique itself on the ovary, on the, on the tissue that surrounds it because the ethanol permeates through the walls of the cyst. This is, um, this is I think, the, the reason for this. Um, the question is, uh, is this, toxic to the entire, it is uh, not too toxic, not as toxic as a cystectomy. Um, I don't know, but the reason is, is clear, it's because the, the ethanol go through the cyst wall and, and have an impact on, on the follicles. That's, that's absolute, a very good question. So that means that it is not a good idea to leave a bit of ethanol behind? We aspirate all the ethanol, uh, yes, you should not uh, let uh, the, the ethanol be on yet. One of the complications described is uh, if you uh, do transvaginal skeletal therapy and you let the ethanol, you can have adhesions uh, after in pelvis. So yeah, we clean the pelvis by we rinse the pelvis uh, after the surgery um, for, for precaution about ethanol, yeah. Okay, uh, there's another question. If there is a recurrence in terms of another lesion, would you go again for sclerotherapy or for cystectomy? Uh, that's a very uh, good question. Uh, in France, and I think it's the same in the European guidelines, uh, recurrence of an endometrioma can be treated by transvaginal sclerotherapy. So that would be an argument for uh, sclerotherapy again. And it depends on what is the recurrence. If it's symptomatic, just the endometrioma, or if you have um, uh, uh, deep endo recurrence too. If you have recurrence of the deep endo and you have an indication for surgery and you go for surgery for a bowel lesion or another one, and you want to treat the ovarian endometrioma, I would like to say that uh, uh, Sclerotherapy is still uh, less tox less uh, dangerous for the um, for the ovary, sorry, for the follicles than cystectomy. But I, we don't have any data about uh, uh, cystectomy after sclerotherapy. Is it uh, do we have a bigger uh, fibrous layer uh, after the sclerotherapy? Would it be easier or harder to perform the cystectomy? I don't. Know. And in your daily practice, do you use transvaginal ultrasound to screen and stage and classify for deep endometriosis and endometrioma, or do you do this by MRI like uh, Horace is doing it in, in Bordeaux? Both, both of them. We have uh, both excellent uh, imaging team uh, in Tunnel. So we have, they, they practice uh, the, the ultrasound and MRI. Uh, they, most of the patients, to say most of the patient will have both uh, of the technique as the, we prescribe in our center for the patient of our center, when you do an imaging in our center, we prescribe both of the techniques, ultrasound and MRI. And who is taking the decision on the treatment? Uh, is, is it a board like in oncology, like an interdisciplinary yeah. endo board with uh, specialists on reproductive treatments or is somebody taking the decision alone? Uh, in Tunnel Hospital, uh, uh, we have a board and uh, all the patients that have endometriosis and that, uh, that have uh, surgery for endometriosis, for complex endometriosis, uh, will be uh, presented to our board and we have uh, an endocrinologist um, uh, RRT specialist, something like two or three, um, in, in imaging uh, team of radiologists, gynecologists, and, and sometimes, uh, yeah, neurologist or a urinary, of a urologist, yeah. 
And, 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 and let's say, maybe it's a difficult question, but let's say there's a 33-year-old patient, more or less symptomatic, infertile, wants to become pregnant, endometrioma, deep endo, which are the factors to say first surgery and, and not IVF, for example? If you have uh, uh, the symptoms first, so if you have a big bowel lesion and you have the risk of, uh, I don't know, risk on the bowels, uh, if she has a bloating uh, symptoms, for example, so this is like the emergency surgery. Um, and uh, the arguments for surgery first is that when you, uh, it is demonstrated now uh, that if you take off the deep endometriosis, and the endometrioma, you will have better and higher uh, pregnancy rate, spontaneous pregnancy rate uh, after the surgery. So to me, uh, uh, that would be one of the, the reasons. And second is, is what the, the woman wants. Uh, if she uh, uh, she's very impacted with the pain, uh, we should treat uh, the pain first. Uh, if uh, the first thing that she wants the more uh, is the, the, the pregnancy and she doesn't want to uh, take the risk of the complication after the bowel surgery and the, the, maybe the three months of uh, the stoma, then the, yes, you will, will go for, uh, for uh, uh, assisted reproductive technology first. But it is a very hard question, you know, because there are two teams of... Uh, uh, there is this battle of uh, like two teams of surgeons, some of them that want to try first uh, two uh, RRT, two IVF cycles. And if you don't uh, make these two uh, pregnancy with these two IVF cycles, then we will do surgery. This is the position of, of uh, our team in, uh, in Tunnel. And there are the other uh, team of uh, other surgeons uh, that uh, would say that it's better to treat first and then do after a spontaneous pregnancy because she will have spontaneous pregnancy, higher rate of spontaneous pregnancy. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, a difficult question. And I think it's good that you told us that you have an endometriosis board at your place because this is maybe the solution Yeah, to have all um, people involved in, in one board taking a decision for the best treatment. So there are uh, more questions. Uh, one is from uh, Ahmed uh, Khalif from Turkey too. And the, the question is if there is a cutoff in size for the treatment. So is there a cutoff size? Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's more about what you have in your operating room. I mean, if you have an ablative technique, a disposable ablative technique, and uh, you're used to use it, uh, you can uh, use it uh, on uh, cysts that are quite bigger, five, six uh, centimeters. But I think that above six centimeters, because the risk of recurrence is uh, doubled if uh, you use an ablative technique, the cutoff of six centimeters uh, would be quite a good one. And if you don't have an ablative technique uh, in uh, your, uh, uh, your, on your site, uh, you can, um, you can lower this cutoff to four four centimeters, like we used uh, in Bordeaux. And um, another question from uh, Professor Keckstein: um, If the ovary is adherent to the pelvic side wall, and there is also endometriosis, what do you do with that endometriosis that might infiltrate also the ovarian tissue from uh, from the side wall? So do you resect this part or you coagulate it or you just leave it like it is? Um, you would say that there is endometriosis on the, the walls of the, 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 yes. the, uh, the ovary. Um, no coagulation. That is very clear. And uh, we have clear data here to say that uh, coagulation, direct coagulation on the ovary hasn't very big impact on the ovarian function. Uh, so we do adhesiolysis, separate the, the, the lesion that needs to be treated, uh, that would be the bowel, for example, if you have a, an ovary uh, and the bowel uh, stuck together. So we separate, we treat the, the bowel lesion. And for the lesion that are on the surface of the ovary, 
I don't think it's a good idea to, to spray, uh, to use your coagulation. Maybe if you have uh, a specific lesion that you want to treat and you can, you have an ablative technique, you can use it as you would use uh, uh, it on the endometrium. But spraying the surface of the ovary, I think it's not a good idea. <clears throat> Although it might bleed when you detach it, of course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In 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 the, in the if the problem is bleeding, the emergency is to treat the bleeding. But sometimes waiting or using a, a mesh to to wait a little bit to pray for for coagulation. Um, <clears throat> uh, Tana Usta is asking again a good question. And he, he says, when you do this treatment, it's, uh, it's only an ablation and you leave the tissue behind. So is there any special reason to use the recurrence rate in sclerotherapy? As you never really get rid of the ovarian endometriosis tissue. Yeah, that's a very that's a very good question. Do we need to care about the recurrence rate because we didn't treat the endometrium? That's one of the way to measure maybe the activity. If if you can uh, if you have something that looks like a recurrence and you can follow and you can see that the cystic is getting bigger and bigger, maybe uh, yeah, that's that's a good uh, information about the, the the activity of the disease. Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. I don't know if there is an answer to that. <laughs> Maybe in the future. Um, yeah. And I would like to come back uh, before we come to an end to the uh, possible malignancy. And uh, of course, this is a rare occasion. But uh, for example, when you have uh, something suspicious in ultrasound following the IOTA criteria, uh, would you recommend to take a biopsy? Or yeah, sure. Would it make sense in any way to take a biopsy? Um, so if you have any suspicion, you need to talk with your patient, but if you have any suspicion, especially if the patient is above 40 years old, there will be no discussion. You need, there will be a discussion with your patient, but the indication, the theoretically, uh, the indication in theory, uh, would be to do a cystectomy. Uh, the, the, there is, even if the, the rates are low, if, even if it's only 1% of the endometriomas, uh, this is a number that is usually used, um, but even if it's only 1%, you cannot stay uh, with this idea. Um, the, the need of a, a, system, a systematic biopsy, um, uh, it's quite hard to say that I treated something with ethanol that maybe I've uh, uh, destroyed uh, disease inside the system. Maybe it's for us to be reassured, but uh, yeah, I think we need to do the biopsy. Okay, um, I think we answered all questions and uh, I would like to thank you a lot for your presentation and your time. Thank you thank very you. much for being with us tonight. Uh, it has been a pleasure for us. Um, many greetings to Paris. And uh, before we end, I would like to hand over to Alin Constantine because he has got some information for um, everybody. Sure. Thank you, uh, Adrian, once again. Uh, yeah, before we close this session, uh, we'd like to uh, let you know about this. So in March, there's going to be the next masterclass in... Um, Is still working? Yeah. Because I had an error. Um, so I hope, I hope you're still seeing my screen. So the upcoming uh, masterclass is going to be in uh, Krakow in Poland, which is fully booked, followed by the masterclass in Duisburg in Germany, which is also fully booked. We're still having three places available in Bern in Switzerland, in London in the UK, and in Budapest in Hungary. And we also like to let you know uh, that the trainees have the possibility to attend um, for two weeks um, uh, several uh, endometriosis center across Europe and also across the US. Uh, 
And I think with this, we can close our tonight's EL webinar. Uh, and you're all more than welcome to attend our next EL webinar in April next month. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks Thank for joining. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.